up for it, find it, make it your own. It's the Get Thrifty Podcast. All right, welcome to the show. Welcome listeners, welcome thrifters, pickers, antiquers, and DIYers from all over the country. You have discovered the Get Thrifty Podcast, brought to you by ARC Thrift Stores right here in colorful Colorado. ARC Thrift Stores is a Colorado thrift store chain. If you're ever in Colorado or you're already here, please visit one of our 31 Front Range and Western Slope locations. You will not be disappointed. I am your host, Maggie Savick, and we are all about sharing everything that has to do with shopping secondhand. We've discovered that thrift customers are literally some of the most unique and gifted people out there, and we are determined to find every last one of them. So if you're a person who's part of our unique thrift culture, please contact us. We'd love to promote your businesses, your social channels, and share your stories and advice with our listeners. You can find us on Instagram at our thrift, send us a DM and let's chat. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited. Today we are joined by Nate and I'm going to give you his whole background, but as you follow along, please sign on to his Instagram page because it's everything of the sort at my vintage is 1976 is the handle. Nate Smith is an Instagram live seller, which so many questions, who specializes in Pyrex. Obviously, we are Pyrex stands on this podcast. He also focuses on vintage kitchen items and much, much more. His passion for vintage has been a lifelong endeavor, but recent events reignited his drive to share his passion with others. An educator by trade, Nate saw an opportunity to Nate saw an opportunity to use the Instagram platform to educate his vintage-loving audience about Pyrex, and he hosts bi-monthly series called Let's Chat About Pyrex. Oh my gosh, so exciting. On what she not only educates people about different aspects of this iconic, iconic vintage brand, but also invites guests onto the show to share their favorite pieces and the details surrounding their Pyrex journeys. He takes every opportunity to spread his knowledge and his joy and his love of loving vintage. When you follow at My Vintage is 1976, you are welcomed into the world of dear friends, Pyrex, a little education, and a lot of vintage fun. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. We're so excited. First of all, you've been recommended by several of our past guests. Um, you are becoming an icon even in the Colorado Instagram scene, just so you know. And we've got a million questions. So I want to start at the very beginning. Um, thank you to Kristen at Basky House Vintage, who really pushed me hard. You have to talk to me. <laughs> so that's exciting. But let's start with your, your background. How did you get into this space? Who is Nate? Sure. Well, I grew up in the backseat of my parents' Bronco in Kentucky. And if there was a wide spot in the road, if there was a yard sale, if there was a thrift store, we definitely pulled over and made every effort to, even if we were going to town, we would stop on the way there and we would probably stop on the way back just in case something else had been put out, you know, in the, in the two hours that we spent um, outside of the store. Um, but fast forward, I went to college, became a teacher, all the things, and kind of separated from that space. I always have had a vintage aesthetic. There have always been vintage pieces in my home. There's always been uh, a constant swing by the thrift store or never afraid to stop at a yard sale. Um, but when we were forced to clean out my parents and my grandparents' home in 2020, that really reignited my love of vintage and I discovered Pyrex which has really <laughs> changed my world <laughs> that is amazing well tell us how Pyrex has changed your world there's like an underground scene here in Colorado that loves Pyrex so I, I, we yes. need more info yes and and that's not just an underground scene in Colorado that is a coast to coast oh, I love it underground subculture that I am swimming in the deep end of the pool. And I, and I love it. Um, so, you know, as you were cleaning out, you just keep running across these sets of bowls. And my mother and grandmother probably thrifted most of these, these sets, these pieces. And because you would still see the label, you would still see the price tag of where mm -hmm. she bought it for, you know, pennies on the dollar. And they're just stunning. 
And I was, as I was going through the home with my sister and I just kept telling her, I was like, I just keep coming back to these. I just, I love them. I can't get rid of them. I can't redonate them. I can't send them to auction. I have to keep them. <laughs> That's amazing. So you actually and collector, do collect. And a collector was born. Yeah. Okay. So you collect and you resell. Yes. I, I often use the, um, the phrase, you know, back of the, the guide, the Rogaine, I'm not just a collector. I am also, you know, I'm not just a <laughs> member. I am also a client, all those things. <laughs> oh, I love this. Okay. So you kind of got into it. You're cleaning out the basement. You start collecting, but you're an educator by trade. What grade did you teach? Yes. Yeah, so I started I always high school. So I was a high school English and theater teacher oh, for cool. many, many years. So I moved to Texas in 2014. So my entire, most up to the, the end of my thirties, I had been in Kentucky. And so when I moved here, I transitioned out of the classroom, became a librarian, and now I'm a counselor. Wow. Okay. So you can kind of do both, right? You can do this yes. love of Pyrex and vintage things and continue with this. But you have turned this into a little bit of a business through Instagram. Talk about that. Yes, absolutely. So I was in the Pyrex world, following the hashtags on Instagram, doing mm -hmm. the things. I had a small little account where I would post some of my own collection. And then I just happened upon the live sales. And there is a huge vintage selling scene on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And before I knew it, that's why, how I was spending my evenings. I was watching various sellers on Instagram and I said, and, and I will oftentimes attribute this to COVID as an educator, I was forced into the Zoom platform. I was forced into group meetings where I had to be on a screen and I had to convey that information to my students well in my world and a theater background I said I can do this oh, yeah. and so <laughs> I it, my vintage is 1976 was born so I mean it just couldn't be more delightful I, I totally resonate with this because I too am a bicentennial baby born in 1976 so I love that we're connected in that way. Um, was that the inspiration? I mean, tell us, is there something special about 1976 and Pyrex as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> so no. <laughs> I, I just always owned my age. You know, mm -hmm. I, I own my gray. I have never really um, steered away from letting people know how old I am. And so I, I knew I wanted the word vintage in my mm -hmm. name. And when I transitioned away from my personal account to a business account, I, I said, you know, well, what is my vintage? And then I was like, you know what? My vintage is 1976. Mm -hmm. And it's also just a nice little segue into allowing my customers to tell me what their vintage is. Yeah. And, and uh, we definitely connect on lots of levels by just kind of owning our age. I love it. it. It's iconic. It's an iconic year and it's a very lucky year, just so you know. I'm, I'm sure you've experienced this. <laughs> yeah. Well, th let's talk more about Pyrex. I mean, everyone seems to love it, but why? What do you think it's about? What is the obsession? Yes, I think, <clears throat> and I've listened to several other podcasts that you have done, and there have been lots of awesome Pyrex collectors on here previously. And I, I feel honored to follow in their footsteps. And a lot of them mentioned it before. And, and I'll mention it again. It's a brilliant brand because they not only did these beautiful patterns, and I'm kind of talking from the 40s that started with mm -hmm. the primary bowls and moved up to snowflake and the pinks and the turquoises up through the 80s. You know, that the, the, those heydays of iconic patterns that everybody grew up with. We, we ate off of Corel butterfly gold in my home when we were, when we were growing up. hundred <laughs> percent. Yes. And so when we have that nostalgic connection, mm -hmm. we remember the dinner table and our grandmother's homes and our parents' homes. And then it's an instant connection. So that gets us to the butterfly gold or the spring blossom or the snowflake. But then you start discovering these other patterns 
and and also they have different sets. So they have mixing bowls, they have casseroles, they have Cinderella bowls, and they have all these different um, kinds of pieces. And so then maybe you fall in love with a pattern and you want every piece in a pattern. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe you fall in love with the casseroles and you start collecting the casseroles in the different patterns and stacking them in interesting ways. So it, it definitely allows for a collector's nature. Mm -hmm. And as a thrifter, you can still find them in the thrift stores. Mm -hmm. I think it's harder to find than it probably was five to 10 years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's still nuggets of gold out there in thrift stores ready to be found. Mm -hmm. And and every day new stuff coming in. It's, it's phenomenal. I, Absolutely. I do have to ask you about this stacking thing because the more I think about it, so many of our guests do have this stacking uh, talk about that like were they made for that in mind was that part of the thought process in Pyrex I, I don't think so but man they're beautiful and I will say just like <laughs> just like when you go to McDonald's and maybe the burger never looks as good as it does where you order than when it does you know when you actually receive it people find ways to find beauty and make beauty and mm -hmm. so in the original advertisements, you will see them stacked just wow. like, you know, in all um, advertisements that are just kind of gorgeous. They want to show off because oftentimes in their mixing bowl stacks or in their casserole stacks, they alternate colors, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. And so to show that interior color, they would stack them. Well, the collector world has just kind of taken off with that. Mm -hmm. And now we not only stack with <clears throat> it's oftentimes you know people ask well what do you use to stack because that's kind of like a, a a secret amongst the collectors and I just use dollar uh floral foam that I use to stack mine evenly okay take note listeners that is like a secret weapon right there okay <laughs> absolutely it keeps them nice and even and, and, and it's spaced beautifully and lots of people use lots of different things um but a lot of people now are making what we call Frankenstacks. So they're taking different patterns and putting them together. And so mm -hmm. maybe not how they were originally intended to be displayed, but using their thrifting touch or creative touch. And as a thrifter, it makes you not feel like you have to find the complete set. Mm -hmm. I can put together my own stack uh, with what I found and there's still beauty in that. And mm -hmm. I love it. And it oh, brings you joy just to look at. I mean, it, they really are beautiful. I mean, I do want to ask, and I, I think I've asked other uh, guests about this, kind of the history, but I feel like you might have a deeper knowledge than anyone I've ever spoken to about this. So <laughs> can you please dive into like the actual history of Pyrex? Sure. You know, there are, there are collectors who collect the older Pyrex, you know, the clears, the etched that happened before kind of 1945 and they introduced their primary stacks, you know, that, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of that iconic uh, yellow, uh, green, red, and blue stack of bowls that we all have fallen in love with. Mm -hmm. And that the was, originals. that had a long run. That was a 20 year plus run of those primary bowls. And that's why you see those probably most often when you go, I call the yellow, uh, the large yellow bowl, the 404 score, because that's the one that you see. And that's the mold number. The 404 is the large bowl. Oh my gosh. There's so much to know about this. It's amazing. Yes. And that's, and that's why I started my Instagram series. Let's chat about Pyrex. Mm -hmm. um, I was introducing pieces of Pyrex in my vintage live sales and people had so many questions. People didn't know that this is the smallest piece in a refrigerator set. People didn't know that the lids are different and why they're different. People wow. didn't know that certain pieces don't have lids. Mm -hmm. So I just took that as an opportunity and starting, I was actually on January 1st of this year, I started a twice a month series, Let's Chat About Pyrex. And it's just all about education. Like I said, my background is in education. And it was just like, here's an opportunity. There are lots of collectors out there who are new collectors, who don't know, who want to know. And so I thought, well, this is an opportunity for me to use this platform that has been so good to me 
to educate. So I love it. I mean, there's there's so much to know. And so you're saying it kind of started in the 40s. It grew for 20 years. But then when did these like iconic patterns that so many of us are looking for out there and like you'll see a TikTok video every day all over this country, someone finding that like amazing, you know, unicorn find. Yes. Well, again, Corning, the the umbrella company and Pyrex used Pyrex to just kind of really hit home with those at the time housewives, Mm -hmm. because not only would they do their standard patterns, the friendships, the, I love the names. (laughs) horizon blue right and so depending on when you were starting your kitchen butter print these kind of iconic gooseberry that go on and on they also did special patterns these promotional pieces mm-hmm. one-offs so and they're were those not, like giveaway with purchase type things they could have been so okay. like the Heinz baking dish went with if you purchase so many you know pro- Heinz products things like that mm-hmm But additionally, they would be in the store and I've been lucky enough to find lots of pieces in original boxes. Wow. Love it. It's a, it's a deep rabbit hole. There are lots of rabbit holes in the world of Pyrex and and boxes is definitely one of them, but you see them with those original price tags of $1.49, $2.49, you know, or even in the individual store, sometimes they've had the store price tag and it's been slashed and marked down 50%. So cute. I love it. Oh my gosh. Okay. So you're, you're doing this counseling thing. How did the live sales come up? How did you finally dive into doing it? Yeah. So I just reached out to a live seller as a live seller. Now I have people reaching out to me all the time. Can you tell us who your mentor was so we can reach out to her or him? Yeah. So my very first, um, partner was Randy's Relics and she was so kind to open her audience and allow me to join her for the first time. She was my first and second co-seller. Oh, wow. Um, So she will always have a special place in my heart and I greatly appreciate her for doing that with me. And then from there, since I was a buyer in the live sales, it was a name that a lot of other live sellers Uh, we're familiar with once I came on the screen Mm -hmm. and you know something about the Pyrex the bow tie it's perfect the theater background (laughs) who who knows but um, it's definitely just been a wild ride I did my first live sale September 23rd of last year wow and I think I had 220 some followers at the time And it has just kind of exploded. I'm over 11,000 followers now in less than a year. And it's just been an amazingly humbling and um, wonderful experience for sure. I just love how open and transparent and helpful this whole community is. And I mean, that is a wild ride. Tell us about the bow tie. Just fun. Have you always done the bow tie or is it relatively new? So, you know. Mr. Smith oftentimes found himself in vintage bow ties. And I think as kind of that entrepreneurial spirit took over and I just thought to myself, well, you know, even if they don't know my name, even if they don't know much about me, they can either say, oh, that guy who sells Pyrex or, oh, that guy in the bow tie. It's iconic. So it just became kind of a signature piece for me. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I've done a live sale with, without a bow tie, because I do think that it's, it, it allows itself to be a connection for people. Mm -hmm. And so I love it. Yeah. I mean, it's a great branding tool. It's a hundred, it it really is iconic and you're, you're building your brand. So I love it. And speaking of your brand, I mean, you're now in Texas, you're a Texan, a true Texan. Tell us about, I've got it. I know, right? Um, You can't see the face that I just got. It's hard to love Texas in July, you know? It is rough. You know, it's it's tough to love Colorado in July even. We're in the hundreds this week too. Um, But, you know, talk to us about Texas and kind of the scene and what it feels like, what it looks like. And I've got a few Texas questions. 
Yeah, so I'm in Dallas, the big D. Mm -hmm. And so this is hands down the largest city I've ever lived in. And I think that it's harder here to find people who don't know. Because as thrifters, as yard sellers, as estate sale goers, we oftentimes hope that we walk into that sale and people don't know what they have, right? <laughs> yes. They haven't done the research. They haven't done their eBay comps, all the things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so because of that, I'm not scared to drive a little out of town. To um, those smaller towns nearby, right? To yeah. the smaller towns nearby. That's the good advice. Sale scene, the estate sale scene in Dallas is rough. I showed mm -hmm. up super early, you know, my uh, alarm clock went off when it was still dark outside. And as far as I knew, I was first in line. No one else was there. And I got my number and it was number 16. Oh, wow. And I said, oh, have other people been here? And the person who came up behind me said, no, they gave one through 15 to all their dealer friends. Um, oh, so, and, and I was the new guy on the block. And so I realized that. And so then I just said, I'm a small town, Eastern Kentucky guy. I need to head to my small towns. Mm -hmm. And so I am willing to drive a little bit for those great picks and um, those thrift stores that I just keep going back to and just, and, and have created relationships with those yeah. people. And the treasures that you can find in those out of town little spots. I did want to ask you, you showed a wall. This is going to be hard to remember, I'm sure, but a wall of like the most beautiful Pyrex I'd ever seen. And I oh, thought, yes. it. tell me about that place. What is that? Yeah. So I have to give a huge shout out Please. to the Vintage Kitchen. Mm -hmm. It's a relatively new antique store in Adamstown, Pennsylvania. Oh, Wow. And so I was, you know, when something on this and they actually hosted something called Pyrex Palooza. And so that's where it came across my Instagram feed. Then I go and I follow the Vintage Kitchen. And I think it's called the Vintage Kitchen and Antiques is their actual handle. Um, but I go up there because I made that an episode of Let's Chat About Pyrex. Mm -hmm. um, because I want to do things for my followers and take them to places where maybe they don't go or th maybe they don't know that they want to go yet. So I traveled to the Vintage Kitchen and gave them a tour of that shop. That oh, that is that. so cool. And you just did it live on Instagram? Yes. Wow. And I, I, I went live from the Michigan Pyrex swap because <laughs> um, I know other uh, collectors here have mentioned swaps before and it is not just Pyrex at these swaps. There's lots and lots of great vintage um, at, available at these Pyrex swaps. Wait, how does a swap Dallas work? Pyrex you're you're going to have to educate me. How does a swap work? Yes, absolutely. So we go lots of, lots of areas host them. I've been to Tennessee, Kentucky, Michigan. Um, there's uh, there's incredible. one in the Pacific Northwest in the Seattle area. Yes. And we just had the Dallas Pyrex swap. Basically, they do an all call for vendors. And it's usually through a Facebook group. And then vendors are gathered. And then it's kind of a just a vintage market with an emphasis on vintage kitchen and Pyrex. For wow. Sure. I mean, it really is nationwide. I mean, this gives me hope that there are, you know, potential people to be on this podcast from now until the end of time. So we're definitely going to hit you up for who I need to talk to next to follow this road, right? Absolutely. And, I mean, it feels like these cookie crumbs are just kind of being left and I'm just like learning more and more and more. Yes. What about thrift stores in Texas? What's that scene like? We haven't talked to anyone in Texas uh, I want to hear about like, you know, shout out some of your favorite places and like the number one spot you you think people visiting Dallas need to go to. Okay. Um, so I am lucky enough when you're in a large city, there are usually lots of thrift stores to choose from. And yeah. Dallas is no different. There are a ton of goodwill mm -hmm. here and available for people. Um, I love going to Casa View Thrift. Um, it's just a little neighborhood thrift store that I usually swing by. Uh, I've, um, I love going to thrift stores too, that benefit a group. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a, a store, a great thrift store here in Dallas called Genesis mm. Thrift. And it, I think benefits, um, 
like women who have been battered. Um, and so it, it definitely, you, you as a thrifter feel have, you'll have an opportunity to give back to a community um, by doing something you love anyway. So why not? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I'm, I'm just finding more and more that uh, these thrift stores are literally everywhere. And I feel like, you know, Colorado, we do a really great job of, you know, we've got tons of thrift stores. I always say it's the Mecca for thrift, but I am learning as I talk to people that there are some cities out there that are doing it right. So we'll add Dallas to that list that they're doing it right. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah, definitely. I will say one thing that was new to me in the Texas scene that I had not heard of before I moved here is they do these thing called trade days. And so uh, probably the largest that happens once a month, uh, it's the weekend before the first Monday of every month is Canton, C-A-N-T-O-N, Canton trade days. And it is a giant flea market. Oh, wow. Um, and so happens once a month and I make a point, it's about an hour outside of Dallas and rarely a month goes by that I don't make my way out to Canton, but lots of other cities, Bowie, Weatherford, it's, it's a thing here in Texas to have trade days or a once a month flea market. Oh my gosh. We need to get that going here. That's incredible. That's yeah. worth going to Texas for. So all these it, smaller cities. It is cities, worth going to Texas for. So it's like a pop-up flea market. Well, it's, I mean, there are some standing buildings as well, but lots wow. of people just come on that particular weekend. And there are people who bring their trailers empty and fill it up when they leave. I mean, it is amazing. Wow. There's there There are standing buildings with people, but then they ha I have what I call the lawn, which are the people who just come and set up and it's amazing. And the finds that I have found there have been true treasures for sure. Well, let's, I like to ask guests about, you know, how we're going to keep thrift and vintage and reselling going in the next few years and, you know, what people's thoughts are on it. What do you think has changed I feel like this wasn't as popular. What do you think happened to our society? What What do you think it speaks to? I think we, who were born in 1976. Yes. <laughs> and thereabouts are now of an age that maybe we are circling back. Maybe we mm -hmm. are appreciating how things were made, the previous design of things, the color that used to exist mm -hmm. that maybe you don't find in newer items. Yeah. Um, and I feel like when we are decorating our homes, it's nice to have a piece of our history that surrounds us. You know, why, why have a new stereo when you can have a stereo with a little bit of age to it or oh, a beautiful piece of Viking glass? on your coffee table to accent, you know, that's just, mm -hmm. it's, or when you have display cabinets, why not put beautiful pieces of Pyrex mm -hmm. there to add color to your kitchen, pick a pattern and you can add whatever color you want. You know, it's, 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 it's a great way to make your house and your home unique to everyone else's. You didn't just go and buy what's on the shelf right now. You've curated a collection that makes your home as unique as you are. Amazing. Absolutely iconic. See, I love it when a guest like writes their own title and their own description, because that was just perfect. Like such a great <laughs> monologue. Thank you. <laughs> and I hate to box you in with this next question, but do you have a favorite piece? Like a, a favorite pirate? piece? Yeah, I do. I'm lucky enough to own a few rare pieces okay. in my collection. And again, that was another reason that I wanted to resell because it allows to feed my collection. Sure. Because when I first started collecting and like a lot of early Pyrex collectors, I think if I saw it, I bought it. If I saw it, I bought it. I didn't know what I was collecting yet. I just knew I wanted it. And then once you amass this collection, you kind of start finding a way and a reason to shave away to really curate those special collections and having it look exactly the way you want it to look. Mm -hmm. So then I started reselling so that I could afford maybe some of the higher end pieces mm -hmm. um, 
in my own collection. So I have a piece called Mod Stars. It's a promotional piece, pretty rare. Um, it's also nicknamed the Subaru because of the star shape. That's oh on yeah, is very remindful of the um, the front plate on a Subaru. So yeah, yeah, I, that's my favorite piece in my collection for sure. Can you tell us, like, is there the one elusive piece out there that's like the most rare, the most expensive? What's going for the <laughs> highest price? Yeah, I will. I will say, and this is just an opportunity to educate. So I yes. hope you don't mind. Please. Like there, there, there are a lot of pieces that people say are the most rare, and they mm -hmm. are. They're so hard to find. A pink stems, a lucky in love, a pop art. So hard. They they just don't come up for sale. But I would say those are not the most rare mm -hmm. because there were a lot of people working in these factories who took the opportunity, maybe after hours, to make pieces that didn't exist. What? And some of those pieces have popped up in collections, in closets, in estate sales. Wait, you mean they put their own spin on? That is incredible. Yeah. I have a very dear friend who... Friendship, we all know the friendship pattern. It exists on white bowls. Well, she has it on a blue bowl. And that was just something that maybe somebody decided to do. There's another iconic piece that is the woodland pattern that's always on brown. Mm -hmm. Well, a friend of mine has it on green. Wow. And so those are the true rares, what we call in the collections, the one of a kinds that you're just not really going to find. And if you find one of those, it's just, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, addition to any collection. Mm -hmm. So, and people there are giving are those, those up. The, const the constellation, um, there is a, there's, and I have two pieces that I am, I'm looking for to my collection. I'm a casserole guy. Those are my favorites. The largest in the casseroles is the 475 size, and there's a pattern called Blue Dianthus. And casseroles usually came in stacks of three. The 473, 474, 475 is the large set. And I have the 473 and the 474. And it's driving me crazy that I do not have the 475. And before long, I'm just going to have to sell off the other two if I can't find the third because the incomplete stack's driving me a little bit crazy. I'm like hoping that our podcast is one of those things where you put it out into the universe and That's somebody right. out there, right? I mean, absolutely. let's spread the word and get it out and find that thing for you. I mean, there's got to yeah. be somebody listening that knows about this. I mean, it really is, it, it's so amazing how much there is to know about this, this just one little piece of the vintage world. Yes. And I will say it, it definitely branches off. You know, when you become a Pyrex collector, it's hard to not also fall in love with all the other iconic brands, mm -hmm. Hazel Atlas, Fire mm -hmm. King, McKee, you start getting international Pyrex. Wow. The, British Pyrex, New Zealand, Australian, Argentinian Pyrex. Like, and so you really, there are lots of ways to curate a truly beautiful and special collection in this world. That is so exciting. All right. So besides Pyrex, is there anything else you love in the vintage world? Absolutely. <laughs> Tell us. Too, too, too many things. Too many. <laughs> so easy so to just I fall in love. It is easy to fall in love. I do. I have a special place in my heart for Viking glass. Mm -hmm. I largely attribute that to Marion at mm -hmm. Mid Mod Marion yep. there in Colorado. Um, I what again when I was a watcher of the vintage live sales, and I still enjoy watching and collaborating now with Marion from time mm -hmm. to time. Um, <clears throat> it's hard not to fall in love with Viking glass when you watch her. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, when, when I was first starting out, she was what I wanted to become, you know, she, she has created a brand and she was all about the education as well. Yep. So in my world, what she did for Viking, I wanted to do for Pyrex and oh, just wow. educate and yeah. let people enjoy things that maybe they didn't even know existed or had seen before.
Yeah. And she's in such a unique part of Colorado where we've got this like very transient community because of all of our like there's Air Force Base, Army mm. Base. So there's just a lot of people coming from all over the world, literally, and they live there for a year and then they leave. So it's all, uh, this constant revolving door. Um, I love that you're tight with Marion. That's amazing. Who else would you want to shout out that's out there in that influencer world that you're in that you think we should be talking to or that our listeners should be following? Yes, I I have three other followers. Yes. Um, vintage resellers who I just had the pleasure of meeting up with in Pennsylvania. We just did a week long picking trip and that was Kristen mm-hmm. at Basky House Vintage, Allison at Skeleton Keys in the Closet. Yep. She's on my list. Yep. And Marcy at Vintage Bulldog. Vintage Bulldog. Okay. We're finding so them the all. four of us for a week spent time in Pennsylvania. We came from four corners of the U.S., from Minnesota, from Maine, from Maryland, and me from Texas, and just decided, you know, it's time we meet in person and do this. And so we we had a wonderful time. We had a wonderful, wonderful time. I just love it. It's just such a family. You know, you guys are just giving me hope that this is just going to continue to grow. And with people like you out there doing this influencing and really, you know, spreading the word, um, you know, the business that I'm a part of will go on and on for ever and a day, as long as this stuff keeps coming in. Yeah, I think I think I attribute my success on Instagram largely to just being my authentic self. You Mm -hmm. know, I've never tried to be more than I am. Mm -hmm. And I, I stay humble and I appreciate every single thing I sell, every single customer who I have sold to. It's just, it's, it's really been a wonderful wild ride. I, I, it's, it is very humbling because to think that I've had the growth that I've had in such a short amount of time, just, it, it means so much to me. So what kind of advice would you give to maybe somebody listening to this that's just starting to dabble? I mean, I think that right there, what you just said is great advice. What else would you say? I would encourage them to watch. You know, there is a huge network on Instagram of vintage sellers. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and there are people who do two separate things on Instagram. And I think both are great. They're what's called static sellers or people Mm -hmm. who just sell on their page. And so, you set those notifications and when they start posting pictures and it's a buy it now price and you want to be ready and you want to be there. But then there's also, and I, and I am not a static seller. Mm -hmm. I don't sell things just on my page usually. Um, And I'm what is called a live seller. And so by following those people who do live sales, you get notifications on the top of your homepage about who you follow that is live that you can go and watch. And so most of us are pretty good about advertising when we're going to go live. And Mm -hmm. so if someone is thinking about doing it, I would do the same as I would tell anybody else, go kick a few tires and do a test drive, you know, Mm -hmm. go out there and start watching and take notes, what works, what doesn't work. And um, the nice thing about Instagram it doesn't cost anything to hit the live button, you know? Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that so, is the beauty of it, right? Yeah. Once once you gain a following, and you might gain a following by being a static seller, um, and then try going live just to see if that following from static sales can transition over to live sales. I've seen it go successfully for some people, and I've had other friends who are static sellers who tried live selling and said, it's not for me. Not I'm just going to go back and do, and just going to go back and do static sales. Yeah. And I do, I do think it takes a special personality. You know, I think it's not easy, you know? So, I mean, but what you're doing is just really doing so much for our industry. So what does the next like five years look like? What are the big dreams? <clears throat> Good question. So when I started this, it was just something to do that allowed me to share my joy with other people. And if I can continue this journey for the next five years and can continue sharing this joy and this education uh, about Pyrex and other great vintage kitchen pieces with my audience, I I can't imagine a happier life. Like I, um, it's kind of like 
educator by day, vintage reseller by night, kind of these two parts of the same Nate. And, uh, and I love it. I, you know, some would say I'm burning both, you know, burning the candle at both ends and busy all the time. Well, I enjoy that. And, um, I know there will come a time when I retire from education. Mm -hmm. I don't see me retiring from <laughs> vintage reselling. Like I, Why I love bother? it because yeah. <laughs> you're always doing something, you know, like if you're not actually selling live, you're sourcing and you're thrifting. And if you're not doing that, then you're boxing up orders and you're invoicing and so there's always this cyclical something to be doing to keep um, inventory up and your uh, audience excited about the next thing that you're going to show to sell. Absolutely. And I just, I love it. And so um, the, the, the next five years will just be me excited about how this will evolve and trying to stay on the front end of the mm -hmm. evolution. Yep. Well, I mean, you're bringing joy to people. Obviously, it brings you joy. I mean, I, I'm I'm blown away with everything you've taught us. Is there anything else you think that our listeners should know from our conversation before I ask you that that one final question? Yes. So I will say my best thrift advice is if you if you have to be in a rush and you have to go through a thrift store quickly, I get it. Mm -hmm. But I have found dream pieces on that bottom shelf. And I think it's so important because that's where a lot of boxed items are. Yeah. We can't put like them up they top. Just, they'll break. They'll fall. Yeah. Correct. And so they just put those boxed items on the bottom. So if that means if you are physically able to get down <laughs> on your hands and knees and see what is on that bottom shelf, do it. <laughs> I would encourage you to do it. And I would also encourage you to go one direction and then turn around and go in the opposite direction. Oh, just in case you miss something. Yes. Your your eyes will see something this the, in the opposite direction that you did not see the first time through. I guarantee it. Wow. Thank you for your service because you're bringing this to people. I mean, this is so important. It's Thank it's you so much. Making me so happy and um at the end of every podcast I love to give a shout out to our queen, one Miss Dolly Parton. And my producer said that I was going to be absolutely blown away with your story, but um, I think you're going to tell it better yourself. So what would you like to say or something you'd like to share about one Miss Dolly Parton? Well, as an original Eastern Kentucky boy, she was an icon being from East Tennessee. So we would travel often to Sevierville and Pigeon Forge and Dollywood. And I remember in my grandmother's home, she had one of those large mirrors behind her sofa and in the corner of that large mirror, there was a family picture and there was a postcard picture of Dolly Parton. So <laughs> she was, she was ever present in, in my family. Oh, home. That's huge. But when we were cleaning out that my grandmother's house, as I suggested earlier, um, there was this giant box. It was like two feet by like 16 inches. It was this giant mail order box and it had never been opened. So my sister and I were there and I was like, I've got, I've got to open this box. I've got to see what's inside. And lo and behold, inside was this Goldberger um, Dolly Parton doll <laughs> in its original box, never taken out that my grandmother had apparently, you know, ordered and had delivered and just kept in that special back of the closet place. Uh, I mean, her entire the, life and that just, and just I still bring have it. It, it like brings it full circle. The whole idea of like collecting and finding stuff in your parents' basement. I mean, yeah, that's just and absolutely amazing. Are you ever going to get rid of her? Tell me no. Absolutely not. No, she, just as she is your queen, <laughs> she has done a lot for my community and I love that. for um, just the world in general. So 100%. she will always have a special place in the back of my closet until somebody cleans it out <laughs> forever and ever. Yes, absolutely. And hopefully another person who like really reveres her ends up with that. So absolutely. that absolutely makes my day. That's so perfect. And I love that it is a full circle moment because it's like another, you know, nostalgic item of our, our past 
tying it all back into thrift. Nate, you are absolutely everything of the sort, a complete delight. Thanks for joining us today. Once again, will you tell listeners how they can find you on Instagram? And if they want to reach out, you're open to that as well, correct? Absolutely. Yes, please reach out. I, everybody who messages me, because I get a lot of questions about Pyrex mm-hmm. and what is this? And do you, can you tell me more about this? And I go out of my way to try to answer every single person. Oh, I love that. Out. But you can find me at my vintage is 1976 on Instagram. Perfect. And I love it that you're open to advice too. And, you know, giving people, um, you know, feedback if they're starting their business or starting to dabble in this world. So again, thanks, Nate, for joining us. Thanks. Thank you listeners for tuning into the Get Thrifty podcast. A reminder, save our pod and leave us a five-star review about how funny, creative, and smart we are. And if you're part of this unique thrift culture and you'd like to be on this podcast, please email me. I'm Maggie at arcthrift.com. And you can always reach out on Instagram as well at arcthrift. Thanks so much and have a wonderful week. It's the Get Thrifty Podcast. This podcast was powered by Arc Thrift Stores and edited by Avocet Communications.